All right, in this lesson we're going to talk about drying. Uh, drying does involve coupled heat and mass transfer, but we'll see that the Chilton-Colburn analogy plays a pr pretty small role here, although we will use it towards the end. Uh, I usually start uh, this section on drying by reading this poem about mass transfer and drying, but my wife is in the next room and there's no way I'm going to read a poem with her there. And, uh, and so... Um, uh, we'll go ahead and skip the poem, and uh, you guys can go on and read it. Uh, okay, well the basic idea is uh, to introduce you to these very familiar ideas of drying that you should have a hot airstream and, uh, and that airstream, if possible, should be flowing fast so that boundary layers are thin. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the key idea of a dryer is that they're supplying the heat of vaporization while creating a small thermal and, con and concentration boundary layer uh, for the heat and mass transfer processes. Now, Drying at, at too high of a temperature, though, can cause chemical degradation, and so you always want to be careful to avoid that. Uh, you also um, uh, will learn here in the next, uh, next slide that the driving force for drying is the difference between the actual moisture content and the equilibrium moisture content. And uh, finally, uh, we need to know that the equilibrium moisture content uh, depends on the humidity of the air and the surface chemistry uh, that will will determine the extent to which water sticks to the material. So here is a little chart pulled from this website uh, that talks about uh, equilibrium moisture contents for a couple of different food products. Uh, so you've got egg, albumin, potato starch, beef, uh, potato and cellulose and what you see here is as a function of the humidity of air this is the the content of water in the air uh, divided by the content of water in the air at saturation uh, you see that as that goes up towards 100 uh, percent right here 1.0 uh, you see the equilibrium moisture content in those materials all increasing as well right so all these things are monotonically increasing curves all of them when you have perfectly dry air go to zero moisture content and uh, they increase from there and can become uh, quite high in their content. So if you look here at a potato, uh, under very, very humid conditions, a potato will keep swelling up and taking on more water, it looks like, up to a point when it's uh, about a third, a third water. Uh, okay, so there are many more examples of materials and their equilibrium moisture contents in Gene Coplis. Uh, note cellulose here, that one basically you can imagine is, is cotton, uh, for all practical purposes, paper. Uh, and, and so that one is, is a pretty dry substance. Uh, its equilibrium state is pretty dry. Okay, so, you know, when we think about uh, a driving force for mass transfer, you're going to have an actual water content, which will be some one of these horizontal lines, say 20% is the actual water content, and the equilibrium uh, water content is much lower, and so that is the gap uh, that will drive, drive mass transfer, drive water off of the material. Okay, so, um, so we can't go any lower than this equilibrium moisture content, though. And so the important variables in drying are uh, the amount of water, this is the so-called free moisture content, X. And that is the, uh, the mass of water in the material minus the mass of water that would be in the material if it was at equilibrium with the surroundings, uh, divided by the mass of dry solids in the material. And uh, the other important property here is the rate of drying, R. Uh, that is in kilograms of water per area per time. And so we're also going to need to know something about the kilograms of the dry solid, the mass of dry solid, and the exposed area that's available for drying. So the, the key equation that describes uh, drying processes is this one. It tells you that that rate of drying uh, is equal to uh, the derivative of the free moisture content with respect to time, which is always going to be dropping. Uh, so by convention, we call R a positive quantity, and so we're going to need a negative sign right here, and there it is. Uh, we also have a ratio of the uh, dry solid content over the area, right? So that converts uh, this quantity on the right-hand side, the derivative of the free moisture content, into the units that are appropriate for R.
And, and that equation is going to turn out to be uh, pretty easy to use. The one thing that we're going to need to know is something about uh, drying curves. Okay, so there are two different kinds of drying curves that you'll see. One of them plots free moisture content as a function of time. Okay, so this is the sort of direct data that you would take if you dipped your t-shirt in, in uh, water and then hung it up on a scale and measured its mass over time. You would see it getting lighter and lighter and lighter and uh, initially it would be dripping wet and as drops fall off of course a lot of mass evaporates it will, or leaves the t-shirt at once and and you see that as this really fast precipitous drop and then after the drop stop falling you enter this period that we call the constant rate drying period and then uh, X just appears to decline linearly uh, with time and eventually the constant rate period gives way to what we call a falling rate period and now the curve flattens out and it takes a very very long time to remove the last little bits of water out of out of the material okay so so that's one representation of a drying curve uh, equivalent but uh, but somewhat different to look at I guess is the uh, this type of drying curve where we plot the rate of drying as a function of free moisture content and in this one the the dripping period uh, is shown right over here that's uh, where the rate of moisture content is is dropping uh, fast as the as the drops stop falling and uh, then you reach this point where you're in the constant rate uh, drying period so the moisture free moisture content is dropping uh, but the rate at which it's drying is not changing and you reach this critical um, you, you reach this critical moisture content where the constant rate period ends and now the rate of drying starts to fall. Okay, so as you further reduce the free moisture content, the rate of drying is starting to drop off. And so there, there, there are two characteristics of this, uh, this drying curve here. We've got the constant rate period and the falling rate period. And those are characterized by the removal of different types of water. Right? So, of course, the water is the same, uh, but the, the interactions that the water has with the surface are different in these two periods. In the constant rate period, uh, we're removing so-called unbound water. Uh, that water is making a thick film over the surface of the material. And so you can imagine the water on the outside of that film, as it's being removed, it was only interacting with the water below it. And so the next layer of water is just like the layer before, because they're all just interacting with more water. Uh, now after the constant rate period is over then that film of water has basically disappeared and now uh, now water has to come up from the interior to the surface there's a def there's a mass transfer resistance there and there's also interactions between the water and the actual surface now uh, so that now we no longer have these uh, unbound waters we have waters that are that are really uh, fizzy sorbed to uh, the material uh, that's being dried and those can take a very, very long time to come off, uh, partly because of diffusion barriers to get to the surface and partly because of the actual inter chemical interactions between the waters and the material. Okay, so let's walk through a little example uh, where we show uh, how one of these calculations would work. Okay, so a solid is to be dried from free moisture content X1 to free moisture content X2. Estimate the time required to do that. Okay, so we have this differential equation that tells us the rate of drying is equal to minus LS over A uh, times the derivative of the free moisture content with respect to time. Okay, so we can integrate that equation and get the, the time to dry from x1 uh, to x2 is ls over a times an integral from x2 up to x1 of dx over the rate of drying as a function of x. Okay, so in order to actually evaluate this integral, we would need some numerical representation of this drying curve, as I showed you above, right? So it's specifically this drying curve that we would need to do that kind of integral. Okay, uh, if we wanted to answer this question and we were given the other kind of drying curve, by the way, we would just look at x, look for x1 and x2 on this vertical axis and uh, find the places where the, the drying curve intersects those and look at the difference in time that that corresponds to. So we wouldn't need to do any integration with the curve on the left. Uh, it's only when you're given the kind of data that's on the right here that you would need to integrate. All right, so um, let's do another example and see uh, how we would find the constant rate of drying 
uh, that is this RC during the constant rate drying period, uh, for a wet sleeping bag two meters by two meters across. Okay, so this is a familiar situation for me. Uh, wet sleeping bags are a pain and we would like to know how long it's going to take them to dry. And in order to know how long it's going to take them to dry, we have to know the rate at which they're drying. Uh, so the first thing we need to ask is what temperature is the sleeping bag as it's being dried? Uh, so there's going to be some adiabatic cooling happening here. Remember that the uh, there's a heat transfer process that has to supply the latent heat of vaporization and that must balance the mass transfer process taking water away from the sleeping bag. So we have some heat transfer coefficient that we don't know. Uh, we multiply that by the temperature minus the temperature at the surface of the wet sleeping bag and we equate that amount of, of heat flux to the uh, mass transfer rate, which is uh, a mass transfer coefficient times the difference in concentrations of water vapor, so I've written this in terms of a total concentration and a difference in, in mole fractions. And then I have to multiply that by the heat of vaporization of water uh, to convert this into a, uh, into a, a heat flux. And now what we're going to do is use the Chilton-Colburn analogy. Uh, so here you have your K over V times Schmidt number to the two-thirds, and your H over C total times uh, heat capacity uh, times a velocity multiplied by a Prandtl number to the two-thirds. So from this, uh, we, can, we can eliminate uh, either K or H from this equation, and, uh, and it turns out, you know, since it's on both sides, then, then we'll just be able to cross them off entirely. And what we find is that the T minus T wet uh, factor that was in the equation above is given by the ratio of the Prandtl and Schmidt numbers to the two-thirds multiplied by a heat capacity over, uh, or sorry, by a latent heat over a heat capacity and then multiplied by the, the saturated uh, mole fraction minus the mole fraction out at infinity of water. Okay, so now we know the temperature of our bag uh, in principle. Uh, the next thing we need to do is to use a correlation to get the actual heat transfer coefficient, or we could start with the mass transfer coefficient because we have Chilton Colburn here. Uh, so here is a correlation that describes that situation pretty well. Uh, it's for flow over a big flat surface. It looks a little different from some of the ones that we've been working with, uh, but that's because it's, uh, you know, for a surface of, of infinite area, basically, this is going to give me a heat transfer coefficient per unit area. Uh, and we have 0 .02, 0 0.0204 times a, um, a volumetric um, velocity. We've got rho times V, which is a, a, um, a mass velocity, if you will, uh, raised to the 0 0.8 power. Uh, the rho V is in, has to be plugged in for a correlation. We always have to think about what the units of the inputs are. Uh, so the rho V has to be plugged into this expression in kilograms per meter squared per hour. And that's going to give us a heat transfer coefficient in watts per meter squared uh, per Kelvin. Okay, so, so now we have the heat transfer coefficient, and now we can really think about finishing up the last step here. So we have to do a heat balance on the constant drying rate uh, in, our, in our drying rate expression. So if the drying rate, remember that was, uh, that was um, in units of, let's go back and remind myself here, kilograms of water per area per time. So we've got a uh, drying rate times a heat of vaporization uh, has to be equal to the, uh, the heat flux to the sleeping bag turned into latent heat, right? Uh, so now solving for RC, we have, and plugging in the correlation for H, here's the correlation for H, here's the T minus T wet, uh, and then there's just this factor of the latent heat in the denominator now, and we know that T minus T wet is given by this. So we could go through and we could plug in all the numbers for this process and find out exactly what what rate the sleeping bag is drying at, um, and then and then use that rate of drying to estimate how long it will be uh, before um, we can roll the sleeping bag up and get back on our way.